we take time now and we look at your word. And Father God, the Holy Spirit is welcome in this place. Father God, I ask that the Holy Spirit would come right now. Father God, may the Holy Spirit come and empower us from on high. Father God, anoint us to overflowing. Father God, may this be the message that you have for us this morning. Father God, may you be honored and glorified. May you bless the reading of your word. May you bless the preaching of your word. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 As we continue our series on the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the reason I wanted to sing that through and just love how God works is because I'm going to skip down a couple of verses. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 2. As we continue our series on the seven churches in the book of Revelation this morning, we're going to preach this morning about the church of Smyrna. And we're talking about Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. But I want you to look down first at verse number 11. Verse number 11 of chapter number 2. And he says in verse number 11, and he says, let me find Revelation instead of Philippians. You'd think with a super giant print, I would be able to find the right book. <coughs> there we go. Give me a second. I wondered why that didn't look as same as I've been studying all week. Anyways, he says in verse 11, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And that's what I wanted to sing through. That's so many times because I want the Holy Spirit to come this morning as we break forth the Word of life this morning. I want us this morning to allow the Holy Spirit to come and to teach us this morning and to just stir our hearts this morning. This morning as we look at the church at Smyrna, I'm going to give you some background about the city of Smyrna in just a minute. But let's pick back up in verse number 8. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And I'm in the wrong chapter again. All right, here we go. Let's back up the page. Verse number 8 of chapter 2. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which, they, which say they are the Jews of the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I am in the wrong, I have a rough time this morning. Maybe somebody else should read this morning. I turned two pages there. And are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Let's back up to verse 9 again. Love, you're going to have to figure out how to edit that uh, video that we're taking this morning. I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit saith unto the churches, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Let me give you a little history, a little background about the city of Smyrna. The church of Smyrna obviously was in the city of Smyrna. Smyrna is 35 miles north, approximately, some said 50, but it's north of the city of Ephesus. We read about Ephesus last week. We preached about Ephesus. Smyrna is 35 to, to uh, 50 miles north of there. Smyrna is a coastal city. It's right on the coast. It's right on the, there's a bay there. Uh, a lot of ships would come in and out. A lot of things going on. It was a very kind of a happening kind of place, if you might say. Uh, the city of Smyrna was actually very loyal to the city of Rome. They were very loyal to them. And so therefore, because they were loyal to them, they also worshipped Caesar. Caesar was in charge at the time in Rome, and so Caesar was a well-known man, but Smyrna just worshipped him and thought so much of him. And so he was the emperor of Rome. Now here's something interesting. The name Smyrna means myrrh. Where have you heard of myrrh before? Old frankincense and myrrh. Myrrh was actually a perfume. It's a, uh, a, uh, a liquid, an anointment, an oil that they would actually use to anoint 
uh, the dead bodies. We talked about Lazarus this morning in Sunday school. But when somebody would die, they would take the myrrh and they would actually anoint the body. Obviously, this was before the modern science of embodying, uh, what do they call it? Embalming. Uh, embalming. 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 embalming and stuff like that. And so they would take these oils and that's what they would anoint them. If you used to go back to Jesus when they laid him in the grave and Mary and Martha would come, myrrh was one thing they came with, with some different oils to anoint him. Uh, Smyrna was called the crown of, the, of Asia. It was the most beautiful city in Asia Minor. It was a very beautiful city. It was a very happening kind of place. There's something kind of neat about uh, the church at Smyrna, Polycarp. Uh, the pastor of the church of Smyrna was burned alive at the stake at the age of 86 because he would not denounce Jesus Christ and he would not worship Caesar. So there's a great persecution going on at this time. And there's a lot of suffering going on at this time. And so the city had, was a large, had a large Jewish community who was hostile to the early church. And if you remember back in the book of Acts, the reason they were so hostile is because the Jews are the ones that persecuted and crucified Jesus Christ. And then later on tried to deny that he even rose from the grave. And they fought against the way, as they called it in the book of Acts, until it was, turned, it was called Christianity. And so the Jews throughout the early church ages were so much against the way in the churches that were established at that time that they even started persecuting them and then later put them to death in many, many different ways. Have you ever heard of the Fox's Book of Martyrs? I've never read it because I've never had the stomach to do it, I guess. Uh, it's a very gruesome book. It goes into great detail. Uh, people that were martyred for the cause of Christ over the centuries. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's a very popular book. You get it at any bookstore or online at Christian book distributors or whatever. <coughs> if you like to read, grab it. Uh, the city was also to, is today known as Iz, Izmir, I-Z-M-I-R, which is in Turkey. And so there's a little bit of history and a little bit of background about this great city. And within this great city is this church called the Church of Smyrna. And it's a suffering church, as we would say. The book of Revelation, he, he outlines it as the church of Smyrna, as the suffering church. It was also, we don't know who started the church. Uh, it could have been Paul, it could have been John, it could have been this pastor Polycarp. Uh, but they don't, history doesn't really say who started the church of Smyrna. This morning we're going to take, we're going to look at three different things. The first one we're going to look at is if you go back into chapter number 2, let's look again at, at verse number 8. And he says, unto, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now we also know that Jesus Christ has given John, the apostle, on the Isle of Patmos, he's given this to write. So he tells him right off the bat, he says that he is unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write. Now these things, he says, the first and the last. We're going to look at some scriptures this morning. If you want to turn to them, you can. Uh, this first point, we're going to get right through it really quick because all I'm going to do is point out some different scriptures to you this morning because we see in verse 8 that Jesus identifies himself for a reason. He wants his church to know how. Remember, the church of Smyrna is a suffering church. This is a church that's going through persecution. This is a church, they take their pastor and they burn him at the stake. And anybody that's not denouncing Christ, they're persecuting, and they're going through great sufferings. And so he says right off the bat, he says, to the first and the last, uh, John chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. If you want to look up here, we've got it right here. Uh, he says in John chapter number 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made. So in the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? God. Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Genesis chapter 1, you say, when will Luke? You sure he was in the beginning? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and God said, let us make man, watch this, in whose image? Who's our? God who? God the Father. God the Father. God the Son. God the Son. God the Spirit. God the Holy Ghost. We got the Trinity. He said, and make in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the flesh of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle and all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So he says, in our image. And so Jesus was in the beginning. He was there. The next portion of Scripture I want to show you is Revelation 22, 13. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, which means what? 
beginning to the end. end. That's what he says next. The first and the last. So here he is. Jesus says, this is who I am. Revelation 22, 20. He which testifies, saith uh, these things, saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And so he says, I am the beginning and the end. And I watch this, and he also, let me just look at John chapter 19 and verse 33. He said, because he follows up back, as we look at this in verse 8, he also says, he says, not only am I the first and the last, but he says, which was dead and alive. So we look at John 19, 33, he says, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they broke on his wings. He's obviously hanging on the cross. So we know that Jesus died. You, you believe it or not, in history, they still they know and they'll document that Jesus Christ, actually a human man, was put on a cross and died. History will state that. Of course, the next part is the part that they don't really don't like. In John chapter 20, verses 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked in the sepulcher and see two angels in white, sitting the one on the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou had, been, had borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. So we find that Jesus, not only, what's 16 say, love? Let's go to 16. One more. Oh, that was 16. Oh, it was? At the end. Oh, at the end. Jesus saith unto her, okay. She turned to herself and wishes to say, Master. So we find that Jesus died and is alive. And he was raised again on the third day. There's the Easter story. We won't get into a lot of that this morning. But I'm just here to tell you this morning that Jesus went through that for you and I. So that you and I wouldn't have to spend eternity in a devil's hell. In a fiery hell. This morning as we look at this, we find that Jesus is setting the stage. He's setting the tone, and he says, I know what you've been through. He said, I know what you're going through. He said, because I've been there. He said, I suffered. He said, I was there before you even existed. I was there after everybody's gone. I'm going to be there. He said, I was crucified. I was nailed on the cross. And he said, on the third day, he says, I rose again. I am alive, and I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus sets the stage, and he says, I've been there. I've done that. How awesome is it when you and I go through some tough times that it's so nice when we get to turn to somebody else that's been there, that's been through it. And a lot of you have been through some trials and tribulations and some rugged time. And I'm here to tell you this morning that the church of Smyrna was a suffering church. I thought maybe this morning, which I don't have time, I was hoping I could be able to find something to put up on the overhead that would show some of the persecution that's going on around the world and a lot of the churches in China that are behind the Iron Curtain that are actually meeting underground and they're scared to even have their Bibles and, and there's so much going on in our world and our society today and I thought, you know, there's a suffering church. And I also thought about our churches today in America. You know what? You and I really have no idea what it means to suffer for the cause of Christ. We have no idea. You know, we think because somebody might make fun of us because we went to church on Sunday morning that that's suffering. We think about maybe somebody will see me in a restaurant praying and asking grace that they're going to make fun of me and that's suffering. I'm here to tell you that that's nothing like what the church of Smyrna went through. Let's look at it this morning as we take and we find out in verse 9. He says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know thy blas the, the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. He says right off the bat, he starts in and he says, you know, you've been through some tribulation. He said, you've gone through some tough time. They were persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. You know, they weren't afraid to get to to uh, have to proclaim their faith in Jesus Christ. They weren't afraid to tell others about Jesus Christ. But because of it, they were persecuted. They were beaten. They were thrown in prison. They were thrown in jail. And they were just really abused because of the cause of Christ. 
Oh, that the church today would realize that we've really got it made, do we not? Amen. You know what, folks? There's nobody going to come and take our sign down at the end of the road. We can put anything we want up there. Regardless of what it says, hey, we can do that with freedom. I'm here to tell you this morning, in America, even though, if you look at the news, and I try to watch some of it, but boy, I have a hard time mm -hmm. watching too much of it and seeing so much of the media, things that are going on. You know what? And I, we all can say without a doubt that our country is headed for destruction. It's headed down the wrong path, and if elections are coming up, I encourage you to get educated on the candidates so that you can play your part in voting. I hope everyone here that's of age to be able to vote votes. You know, there's something on Facebook that said, and I, I watched this, and it said, you know, I had a whole group of, I mean, just millions of people, and one person says, well, I don't vote because mine doesn't make any difference. Imagine if everybody said that. Mm -hmm. oh, and I don't, not, I don't get into politics by any means. I'm not going to tell you who I'm voting for or anything like that because I just don't believe that that's the place in the church. If you want to know, come to me personally, and I'll tell you when I find the answer. And so, anyway... Um, but I'm here to tell you this morning that even though our churches, are, our country's headed down the wrong path, we still have some freedoms, but just they are being attacked. Our freedoms for religion are being attacked. And everything they're trying to do, they're trying to attack our religion. They're trying to attack the church. You know, just this thing that just passed not long ago about same-sex marriage. And, and people say, why do you get so riled up about that? Outside of the fact that it's sin and God hates it. I mean, that's just one of the things. But the other thing that most people don't realize that it's in there, that you do you realize as a preacher and a pastor, if I conduct a marriage ceremony for somebody of the opposite sex, and then I reject somebody of the same sex, I can go to jail, I can go to prison, it would affect our church, and it would affect our association. A lot of people don't realize that. And so that's why there's a lot of preachers that are saying, you know what, we're just not going to conduct it. We're not going to do that. Some of the other preachers were trying to figure out how to make sure that we stay outside, the, stay within the legal realms, but also so that we don't get in trouble so that we can still fulfill what God has called us to do and for performing those. And there are ways, and I'm finding out ways that we can do that and still be safe. And so, but I'm here to tell you that that's just one way that they're trying to attack Christianity. And I could go down a list and list of different people that you've seen on television in the media. The lady that there was a clerk of courts got thrown in jail because she wouldn't sign the marriage certificate. Because it was a same-sex marriage. Even though there was a bunch of other people in the office that would have done it, they zeroed in on her. I'm here to tell you this morning that you know, our churches are under attack, our country's under attack, Christianity's under attack, but I'm here to tell you this morning that it's nothing like the church of Smyrna went through. You know what? There's nobody here that's going to come through those doors and come in and lock the doors behind and lock all the doors, surround this place and go to each one of us and tell us that we need to denounce the cause of Christ or they're going to shoot every one of us. We don't have to fear that this morning. Now, is that a real possibility? Absolutely it is. I hope somebody here cares, by the way. But anyway, uh, you have my permission as a pastor to carry concealed weapon in the state of Georgia. You just have to have permission in the churches. But anyways, we won't get into all of that. But I'm here to tell you this morning that we are not being persecuted like the church of Samaria was persecuted. Not only were they persecuted, but they were martyred for their faith. They were burned at the stake. They were just destroyed. They were torn apart. They would be thrown to lions. And whatever they could think of, they were being persecuted. They were even crucified. Peter himself was crucified upside down on a cross because he said, I don't feel worthy to be crucified like Jesus was crucified. So they hung him upside down. And they persecuted to the point where they would kill the people in the churches of Smyrna. They were hated because of their faith. Look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. This is what this says. Because you know Jesus warned them. And he warned them ahead of time. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 22 he says, And ye shall be hated above of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth the end shall be saved. He says, you're going to be hated. And you know what? As I read that verse and I was going through this in my studies, I thought, you know what? Have I, have I ever been hated because of my faith? And I thought back and I thought, you know what? Nobody's ever hated me because of my faith. Maybe it's just because I'm a good-looking guy and everybody likes me. I don't know. But you know what? I've never been hated because of my faith. And you know what? I've been in some pretty bad places. You know, the state of Maine, we talk about it, is actually there was a study done where the state of Maine is one of the darkest spiritual states in the entire country. The fewer people will claim to go to church, fewest people in the entire country claim to even pray, 
few speak. Now that doesn't mean there isn't Christians there because there are, and we was able to, to fellowship and we was able to pastor, inter pastor, and go to church and stuff like that. But per capita, for the people, it's one of the darkest states in the entire country, spiritual wise. And what's so refreshing is when you come to Georgia, part of the Bible Belt, we really don't even come close to suffering for the cause of Christ. We were sitting in uh, Dairy Queen the other day, having a little sandwich and an ice cream, which was a pretty good deal. But anyways, I'm sitting there, and there's Christian music playing over the intercom. And every place you go, in different restaurants, and different stores, there's Christian music being played. If you don't realize it, if you don't think you're pay attention sometimes. Even in Walmart and Waycross, they're playing Christian music. Unbelievable. That's not the kind of stuff that you see in a place called Maine. You just don't see that in a place called Massachusetts, which is even worse as far as uh, being a dark state. And But at the same time, you know what? Even they're not pers being persecuted. And certainly here, we're not persecuted for the cause of Christ and because of our faith. You see, oh, the preacher, on, look on Facebook and all these people will say something spiritual and they're being persecuted. Seriously? That's really not persecution, folks. It's freedom of speech and freedom of opinion. But I just thought to myself, have I ever been persecuted because of my faith? And I have to tell you honestly, you know, I haven't. Now listen, I'm not looking for it to come my way, believe me. But at the same time, I will not step down from admitting that I am a child of the King. I'm here to tell you this morning that as a born-again Christian, nobody's going to come and put a, head, a gun to my head and tell me if I denounce Jesus Christ, they'll give me millions of dollars. It just ain't going to happen. Go ahead and shoot me because you know what? The Bible said to be absent from the body is to be where? Present, Present with the Lord. Woo! Amen. Amen. Now listen, I'm not rushing it, so y'all don't get any ideas as far as going to deceive my baker. But at the same time, I'm not here this morning to tell you that this morning that I'm being persecuted for my faith. But you know what? There's a Pastor Saeed that just got released from Iran that was persecuted for his faith. And how many years in prison? Seven years or something like that? Because of just being a Christian and a pastor. And he got released last week or week before. And I just thought to myself, are we really even doing anything that somebody would accuse us of having faith in Jesus Christ? Yeah. How does our life live? As we walk out into the community, as we go outside these doors here in just a little while, do people look at us and say, there goes a Christian, there goes a Jesus freak. What's wrong with being called a Jesus freak? Yeah, I freak out over Jesus because I love him because of what he's done for me. But all that people would take and they would have a little persecution on him for having the faith in Jesus Christ. Do you stand up for him at work? Do you stand up for him in the restaurants? Do you stand up for him out in public? Maybe the hospital, wherever it would be. Do you stand up for your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Or do you cower down because you don't want to be persecuted for his faith? And in many, many ways that we can stand up. You never hear somebody give a testimony in church in the United States of America saying, well, you know what, I was persecuted this week because I had preached the gospel standing on the street corner. I was thrown in jail because I told somebody how to get saved. You just don't hear it. Ah, uh, that you and I would understand that the church of Smyrna was persecuted because of their faith. They were hated. People hated them. Now listen, nobody wants to be hated. Everybody likes to be liked, do they not? We don't want to be hated by anybody. We don't want anybody, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We just love people. But oh, we may not step over the boundaries of giving up our faith. Maybe you're at work and there's a bunch of people standing around and a dirty joke is told. Do you stand up or do you kind of join in? You say, I don't know how to stand up. I'm too chicken. Guess what? Walk away. That's standing up. Somebody starts gossiping. Uh-oh, I'm sorry. That one hurts. Do you join in on the middle of a gossip session or do you turn around and walk away? <coughs> oh, that you and I would stand up for our faith. I told you a story real quick about a man that was I worked with up in Macon and and he was on the tractor, on the excavator, and he was constantly just taking the Lord's name in vain. I finally walked up to him and I said, Hey, you know my friend. He said, Yeah, who's that? I said, Jesus Christ, you talk about him all the time. Just not in a good way. He changed his language that quick. Come to find out he was a Christian, but he was 
just wasn't living right. And so we got the chance to talk with him, and he went through some tough times. We prayed with him, God healed him, and he went back to serving the Lord. Amen. It wasn't because we stood up, it was just because God stirred his heart. And because we took a stand when the tough times came, he came to us. And people will do that. Not only did they get persecuted, but they were also a financially poor church. Look what it says. And back in the verse 9 again, he says there, he said, and tribulation and poverty. He, they were poor. They didn't have any money. You might know what that's like. <laughs> to be poor and in poverty. Actually, the word poverty or poor actually means uh, that they didn't have, uh, it says, to bed, destitute, not be able to even put food on the table. That's how poor this church was. And these people in this church, they were so poor. They, could, they were so poor they couldn't afford to pay attention and all those other words. And all those other things that people say, how poor they are. But yeah, you know what? I look back and yeah, I've been through some rough times in my life. But I think, you know what? I've never gone without a meal. There's plenty of people out there that have gone without a meal. Even here in America. You know what? I've never gone without something that I didn't need. I didn't say want, but I've never gone without something I needed. God has always supplied my needs. He's always given me food on the table. I've always had a roof over my head. I've never been homeless. These people in the church of Smyrna were so poor they couldn't even afford to put food on the table. They had no idea where their next meal was coming from. And all our churches in America, we just think, man, I'm so poor. I can't hardly afford to pay the car payment, the house payment, the boat payment, the motorcycle payment, <laughs> the credit card payments. I don't know how I can do it. I am so poor. Oh, if we, you and I really knew what it was like to be poor. You want to know what it's like? Go find your homeless man or a homeless woman. They at one time was doing very well and then because circumstance, circumstances came into their life, now they're just scrounging in the garbage cans. I love to see it on Facebook where people are helping some of the homeless. I've got a deep burden for homeless people. I can't find anybody here in Axon, obviously. I know they mean they're not here. I just haven't found them. And I, I love to do for homeless. I've told you before, I, I go feed them. I don't give them any money, but I love to feed them. And I would love to be able to do more for them if God will lead us in that direction. But you know what? The church at Smyrna was poor. But what's the next phrase that he says? But thou art rich. But thou art rich. He said, you might be poor worldly. He said, you might be poor as far as material goes. He said, but because of who you are, because of your suffering, because you do not denounce the cause of Christ, he said, you're not poor. You're actually a rich man. You're actually a rich woman. And the reason that you are is because you've got Jesus Christ in your heart and your life. I'm here to tell you this morning that the richness comes because you are rich in joy. We're rich in peace. We're rich in love. We're just rich in happiness and everything else that goes along with being rich. And he said, not only are you rich in that, but he says you're also rich in the hope that one day when you go from this life on to the next, he says that you're going to spend eternity in heaven with me. Amen. That's where the richness is. He says, lay up your treasures in heaven. How do you lay up your riches in heaven? Loving God. Serving God. Doing for others. Your tithes, your offerings. We go down through the list. That's how you store up treasures in heaven. Because you know one day, you might be able to think that you're going to be laying in that coffin and they can throw all your money, all your worldly possessions in that coffin with you. But guess what? It's going to go six feet into the ground and that's where it's going to stay. Came into this world with nothing, you leave this world with nothing. Isn't that amazing how God works? Now listen, there's nothing wrong with enjoying things while you're here. I'm all for that. I love to enjoy things that God has created on this on this earth, and I have no problem with enjoying them. But I'm here to tell you this morning, if you want to be rich in God, then you've got to know the Son, Jesus Christ. And then the hope and the happiness and the joy will come. You not only that, in verse 10, he says, For fear not. He said, I know you're going through these sufferings. I know that you're going through persecutions. But he says two things. He said, number one, fear not. And when I hear that, he said, don't worry. He says, fear not. Persecution is coming. You look at it, he says, it's only going to be here for ten days. As I studied through that, now here's some different thoughts. Ten days. But it could be a literal ten days. In other words, the church was going to be persecuted. And they would go through a time of persecution and jailment for ten days. That's one thought. The other thought is that the ten days could actually be in the Bible day. Sometime is a time period. So it could be different time periods. Because if you read history, you find that it actually the persecution for the church lasted 300 years. 
So there could be time periods today. Either way, what Jesus is saying here, he's saying that this is going to be, and they all agreed with this, all the commentary, all the philosophers, all the scholars said that it's going to be for a short time. He says, hang in there, fear not, he said, because it's only for a short time. You may be going through some trials and tribulations. You might be going through some hard times. You may be going through loss. And you know what he said? He said, just hang in there. Don't worry about it. Fear not. He says, it's just for a short time. You realize they were being persecuted and they were thrown into jail. They were tried for their faith. And then they were burned at the stake. And they said, you know what? That's okay. It's only for a short period of time. Because if you burn me at the stake, if you persecute me, if you crucify me, I will be in heaven one day with Jesus Christ. Amen. And he says, fear not. He said, don't worry about it. What are you worried about? What are you fearing? What kind of trials and tribulations are you going through? Well, Robin's mom's going through some pretty rugged times. He says, fear not. He says, I got it. That's not easy, is it, Robin? I'm honest. I'm human. Just like the rest of you. And you can't say, well, just put it on the back burner. God never said that. God never says in His Word, don't think about it. When he says, fear not, he said, go ahead and think about it. Go ahead and dwell on it just a little bit. But he says, fear not. Have no fear. I've got this one under control. Amen. You're not going to do away with it right now. Don't take it out of your mind, but turn to God and say, God, I lay it in your hands. I'm not going to fear for it because you're in control and you will do what your will be done. But we're going to pray for healing. We're going to pray for God's will. We're going to pray for comfort, but we're not going to forget it. He says, fear not. A little bit later down, he says, be faithful. He says, hang in there. Be faithful. Keep praying. Keep talking to him. Keep reading the word of God. So many times we go through trials and tribulations in life and we just want to turn from God because we want to blame God. Listen, I'm here to tell you this morning, don't blame God for anything you've been through, anything your loved ones are going through because God didn't do it. You know who did it? Sin, who is caused by Satan, the author of confusion, the author of sin, the father of this world. He's the one that causes the sin. He's the one that caused Adam and Eve to sin in the Garden of Eden. And because of that, sin came upon mankind. So if you want to blame somebody, don't blame God Almighty. You blame that old rascal, the devil. And when you get to glory one day, and you get to come back in Armageddon, and you get to come back in the battle, you say, Jesus, give me a to him. I want it, that devil. tribulations. I went through some trials and tribulations quite a few years ago. I didn't lose anybody. I lost a marriage and I'm here to tell you that I didn't stay faithful very long to God. I stepped aside. I thought I was done. God got a hold of my heart a few years later. And my prayer now because of it is that I would stay faithful no matter what God puts me through. You say, are you going to get through some rough times again? Absolutely. Absolutely, because if Jesus doesn't come back soon, guess what? One day my folks are going to pass away. I praise God, both of them are still alive and kicking and aggravating and ornery just as they can be. I'm Florida <laughs> living with my sister, and I appreciate that. <laughs> now I love my parents, I love my sister. But yeah, one day they're going to go to eternity. They're getting closer and closer. I watched them experience some things because I'm going to go first because I couldn't handle her going first. So you know what? Yeah, the top trials are going to come. The tribulations are going to come. And pray that I'll stay faithful. I pray that God will stay close and I will stay close to Him. I know He'll stay close if I'll stay close to Him, but He says to be faithful. Again, in that verse number 10, I want you to look at it real quick. I'm sorry I'm running out of time, but I want to, I want to show you this. For none of these which thou hast suffered, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. The devil is the one to blame. Not God. Stay faithful. And then in verse 10, he says the reward. I'm going to show this to you real quick. He says a little bit later down at the end of it, he says, I will give thee a crown of life. 
If you stay faithful to me, I'll give you a crown of life. When we think about this crown, it's not a crown that the worldly king would wear. It's not a crown that a pageant winner like Miss Tammy, who won the Miss Universe pageant back a few years ago. Oh, wait a minute, that was at Jerry's house. <laughs> but it's not the crown that you would put on physically. Jesus says, if you'll stay faithful and you'll fear not, he said, I'll give you the crown of life. This crown is a victor's crown. This crown, he makes a promise. He says, if you'll stay faithful to me and you fear not, he said, I'll give you the crown of life. He goes on and he says, also, he says, that you'll escape. We'll get this at the bottom. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The second death is separation from God. The first, the, the first death is when you die physically out of this old body. And then the second death would be separation from God. He says, if you'll stay faithful, and you'll fear not, I'll give you a crown of life, and you'll, you'll escape the second death. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Are you here this morning? Did you hear what the Holy Spirit had to say? <coughs> if nothing else, fear not and stay faithful. No matter what comes your way. Let's stand together.